thank you very much for sticking around for the afternoon, and uh, thanks again for having me. Um, so today I'll be talking primarily about how I approach untreated patients with mental <coughs> cell lymphoma. Uh, Peter will be talking after me, and we'll be tackling uh, a lot of the uh, sort of newer uh, therapies that are primarily used in the relapse setting. So these are just my disclosures. So first I'll talk just briefly about mantle cell lymphoma. It is a rare disorder, and so I typically start most of my discussions with just a brief overview of the disease, just to get everyone up to speed. And then we'll talk about um, how we uh, have incorporated some prognostic indices uh, into the evaluation of newly diagnosed patients, as well as um, what impact these may have on, on treatment selection. Uh, and then I'll talk some about the selection of uh, approaches for untreated patients. I think it's important to recognize that in 20 minutes it's impossible to highlight all of the different uh, um, treatment approaches that are out there. Uh, if you go look at the NCCN guidelines, you'll see that there's quite a menu of options, but I'll try to highlight some of the key points. <coughs> Uh, so mantle cell lymphoma is a rare disorder uh, at, at Cornell um, and at other, other large centers. It's seen quite frequently, but um, in, in the community and, and in general, it's a fairly rare uh, form of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, fortunately, it is characterized by this specific uh, immunophenotype as well as cyclin D1 positivity uh, and this characteristic translocation. And so making the diagnosis is typically pretty straightforward as long as you are uh, considering it in your differential diagnosis. Uh, it is frequently fa uh, found to be stage four at the time of diagnosis, and this is, a, this is often a sticking point for patients because one of the first things they want to know is what stage am I, and almost all of them have stage four disease due to bone marrow involvement, uh, as well as frequent splenic and GI tract involvement, and I often try to take that opportunity to inform them that despite the fact that they do have advanced stage disease, uh, that with current approaches to therapy, we can expect them to still to uh, enjoy uh, a prolonged life expectancy in the majority of cases. So for now several years, we've had the Mantle Cell Lymphoma International Prognostic Index, or the MIPI, uh, which uses uh, these four uh, pretreatment variables, which can be easily identified at the time of diagnosis, as opposed to the uh, follicular lymphoma IPI or the uh, IPI that we use for large cell lymphoma, one of the challenges is that this is not, or that each um, variable is not accorded one uh, point. And so it does require a little bit of a calculation. Uh, there's a number of places online that you can go. Uh, but what you can see in these two Kaplan-Meier curves is fr from the original publication as well as from an update now from a few years ago, uh, is that patients are divided into low, intermediate, and high risk. And you can see that the high risk group, whether you're using um, treatment that was done right around the year 2000 uh, or more recent uh, studies, uh, that the high risk group still has an overall survival of less than three years. Uh, fortunately, the low and intermediate risk groups do tend to be uh, improving, and we're starting to see some narrowing of the, of the gap between the low and intermediate risk. We've also looked at uh, MIPI uh, in several additional cohorts, uh, including one uh, that uh, we did at Emory uh, from five different sites, uh, which actually shows that perhaps the high-risk MIPI uh, patients aren't doing quite as poorly as they um, have been in, in, in other studies. Uh, I think it's just important to recognize that MIPI is, is, is not an exact um, measure of how patients are going to do, um, but it's just one uh, feature to keep in mind when considering a new patient. Uh, in addition to those clinical and laboratory risk factors, we also have the KI-67 proliferative index, which is now frequently obtained at the time of diagnosis for most patients. Uh, this is measurable by IHC, but can vary within a patient uh, and can certainly vary uh, among pathologists. Uh, we frequently use a cutoff of 30% to identify those patients that are high versus low risk based on this publication um, from the German group. Uh, and as you can see in this, in this publication, those patients that had a KI-67 of greater than or equal to 30%, uh, the outcome was quite poor. Uh, we recently looked at this in a uh, multi-center uh, fashion through the Lymphoma Epidemiology of Outcomes group. And uh, interestingly enough, 30% was the most common KI-67 value that was reported on pathology reports. Uh, and so it just speaks to the fact that uh, for pathologists, it can sometimes be challenging uh, to really distinguish one versus the other. Uh, we've now had an opportunity to combine KI-67 with MIPI to form the MIPI-C or the combined MIPI. And as you can see from this table, those patients that have a low MIPI as well as a low KI-67 have a, a median overall survival of greater than nine years. However, we also now are identifying a particularly high risk group of patients that have a high KI-67 
and a high-risk MIPI, uh, and they have a mean overall survival of 1.8 years. And so with these data, we're now better able to identify those patients that are in need for alternative therapies uh, and as opposed to those patients that are likely to do well regardless of the approach that we use. Cytogenetics has also been described uh, as a risk factor for uh, mantle cell lymphoma. It is frequently used in uh, AML as well as CLL and hadn't frequently been used in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, but in this particular project that was led by Brian Greenwell, who's now at the Medical University of South Carolina, uh, those patients that had a complex karyotype, which uh, was about 20% of patients in a five-center study, uh, had uh, an inferior uh, progression-free survival uh, as well as an inferior overall survival. And you can see that those patients that didn't necessarily uh, have the complex karyotype had a pretty uh, had a significantly prolonged overall survival of 11 and a half years. Uh, in the uh, bar graph at the bottom, you can see some of the most commonly identified cytogenetic abnormalities. Uh, in this particular project, it was difficult to identify uh, any uh, any specific outcomes related to the cytogenetic abnormalities. Although the loss of 17p, which is the fourth bar over from the left, has in other studies been shown to be uh, associated with inferior outcomes. And then finally, there's been a number of different muta recurrent mutations and aberrations that have been associated with clinical outcome, uh, most notably TP53 mutations, which you can see in the top center of the slide uh, from the Nordic regimen. Uh, this uh, Nordic uh, protocol uses uh, aggressive cytarabine-based induction followed by transplant. Uh, and you can see that in this cohort of patients, even uh, that receive such an aggressive uh, approach, that the outcomes are significantly uh, inferior. I would point out, however, that this is a fairly small number of patients, and so while this is uh, clearly, uh, while this is likely associated with inferior outcome, I think additional study is likely necessary uh, to better identify these patients. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that is typically obtained at all, in all patients at the time of diagnosis, uh, but I would argue that it should be, and it's something that we're um, starting to do in our own center. Uh, in addition, though, there are a number of other abnormalities that have been identified. One of the challenges is that you can identify high-risk features, but even with TP53, you don't necessarily have a, an intervention to offer uh, outside of an investigational approach. And so while this is, I think, important uh, for understanding what to expect for patients uh, with mantle cell lymphoma, I can't necessarily tell you what I do based on finding one of these high-risk features. So this, I would say, would be a traditional approach to treatment. Uh, it has been used probably most frequently at, at many centers. So first, you confirm the diagnosis and complete the staging and prognostic workup. Uh, I have a sort of the light-colored arrow going over to observation. And so this is something that's been used uh, infrequently in the past. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the data that would support uh, this approach for patients with uh, asymptomatic disease. Uh, but the primary question for many patients when they are first seen is whether or not they're a candidate for an autologous stem cell transplant. And those that are have traditionally gone down the intensive pathway, and we can talk about some of the different uh, induction approaches, uh, and then gone on to an autologous transplant. Those that are not candidates for transplant have gone down a less intensive uh, induction therapy pathway, uh, potentially with something like bendamustine rituximab. And then in both cases, there are data for or against maintenance therapy uh, that uh, should be considered. However, I, in my mind, this is a, typically a much more complicated discussion and decision uh, pathway than, than just that. So for, and, and I've, at least for the purposes of my own thinking, have divided this into four different groups. So you have those patients that are under 60 and healthy. Uh, you have those patients that are in their 60s, uh, but healthy enough to receive therapy. Then you have elderly patients, which I've used to the cutoff here of 70, although some could argue that that could be 73, 75, um, and then frail patients. And at all stages, I think it's really important to consider symptoms as well as their uh, disease stage and tumor burden uh, and, and <laughs> prognostic markers, although as I pointed out before, it's hard to point to too many places where a prognostic marker is going to make a definitive impact on your treatment choice. Uh, one of the uh, things I would point out for this sort of 60-year-old <laughs> group uh, that, that is often a discussion, at least in my own clinic, is patient preference. So I have some patients that come to me that are 65 years old and would potentially be candidates for aggressive therapy and potentially a transplant, uh, and they want no part of it. And so, you know what, I understand I'm going to relapse maybe a little bit earlier, and that's okay. Others want to be uh, very aggressive. And so I think it's really important to have that type of a discussion with all of your patients, but especially those uh, that are sort of in that uh, middle range. And then at the bottom, I've highlighted some of my, uh, my, my typical approach. So for young patients, uh, uh, that are healthy, I usually move forward with a cytarabine-based approach followed by transplant and first remission uh, and strong consideration of maintenance rituximab. For the sort of middle-aged uh, healthy patients, 
Uh, some go forward with an intensive approach, whereas others uh, I don't. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the data for maintenance rituximab in the less intensive group. Uh, and then for the older patients, I typically don't offer cytarabine-based therapy or stem cell transplant, but based on their level of fitness, would consider uh, chemoimmunotherapy-based approaches versus uh, rituximab lenalidomide or potentially less aggressive approaches. <coughs> So just some general considerations. I, in my opinion, uh, observation should be a consideration for all asymptomatic patients, regardless of their age. I say consideration. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily how you move forward, but I think it's something to, to talk to patients about. I would also point out that ibrutinib and acalabrutinib are not currently indicated in the front line alone or in combination. Uh, but in some instances, you could potentially tr consider it in frail patients. We do have some frontline data um, with ibrutinib as a single agent, and it's also being evaluated in combination. Uh, and then finally, I would highlight that clinical trial enrollment is preferred in all settings. And I'll go over some of the studies that are currently open or soon to be open uh, in the frontline setting. There are a number of effective therapy options, and if you ask 10 different people, you may get 10 different thoughts regarding which is the most appropriate. Uh, and so I think additional studies are needed to help uh, parse some of this out. So first, just to identify those patients that could potentially be observed. And so on the left is Peter's uh, curve. Uh, which is now almost 10 years old, uh, highlighting the experiences at Cornell, uh, where they separated patients into those who were de uh, deferred therapy for 90 days versus those that didn't. Uh, and as you can see, there was no significant difference here uh, in, in outcome. Uh, we then looked at this in the National Cancer Database, and the red curve are those patients that were deferred, uh, whereas the blue curve are those patients that were treated within 90 days of diagnosis. Uh, and this actually was a statistically significant improvement in survival. I don't, I'm not arguing that deferring therapy improves survival, but I think it does highlight the fact that these are patients that have typically low risk disease and that are likely to enjoy a prolonged uh, overall survival. And then on the far right is another panel where we combined uh, treatment from, uh, combined data from five centers uh, and found a very similar finding that these patients who defer therapy for three months, uh, for at least three months, don't have an inferior outcome. So throughout all of these studies, there have been a couple of co consistent predictors of deferred therapy, uh, and, and these are not surprising. So lack of B symptoms, a normal LDH, uh, presenting with the leukemic non-nodal presentation, uh, although this is not a, this, there are patients who have nodal disease who I, I think can safely be observed, good performance status, as well as a low KI-67. And so really, despite all of the different progress that's been made with molecular risk stratification and so forth, at the end of the day, at least for me, I make a decision about whether or not a patient can be observed primarily by how they look when I walk in the door and how they're feeling. If they come from their primary care physician because they had an asymptomatic lymphocytosis and their white count is 12,000 and they otherwise look well and have very limited nodal or no nodal disease, I typically feel comfortable observing these patients. If they come in because of symptoms, then I'm not going to necessarily offer them observation, even if they have limited radiographic evidence of disease. I think it really depends on how the patient is doing. And then this table just summarizes uh, now several studies that have looked at the role of deferred therapy from a number of different centers. Uh, and as you can see, the median time to tra treatment has varied considerably. I would say that at this point, patients, now that deferred therapy is being considered a little bit more frequently, you probably have more patients that are being deferred longer. Uh, but as you can see here, there has never really been a significant uh, overall survival decrement uh, by deferring therapy. I would point out that these were all retrospective projects. We don't have any randomized studies to support this approach. Uh, but, I, but I think that also speaks to the fact that we've successfully identified low-risk patients uh, just by doing a good clinical assessment. So I'll talk a little bit about some frontline options. Again, this is by no means exhaustive. Uh, on the left is the MCL Younger trial, uh, which combined our uh, chop with our DHAP uh, compared to a non-cytarabine con uh, containing regimen. And as you can see here, there was a significant benefit for those patients who did receive cytarabine as part of their treatment. On the right is the Nordic uh, trial, which alternates our maxi chop with rituximab and ARC. Uh, and again, this induction regimen has been associated with prolonged progression-free survival. These are both typically given prior to stem cell transplant. Uh, and as you can see at the, on the x-axis, you are measuring now in eight to 10 years, uh, it's eight to 10 years before patients progress. And so a patient who's young and fit and a candidate for transplant and who gets through therapy and gets to, tra and gets to transplant and so forth, can, at this point in my mind, many of them can expect to have a prolonged progression-free survival of eight to 10 years. Although, as you can see, there does not typically, we don't typically see a plateau and most of these patients will ultimately relapse uh, if, they, uh, if they live long enough, which hopefully most of them will. <clears throat> 
There are a number of other frontline approaches. There's our DHAP alone, um, uh, combined with transplant and rituximab maintenance. Our hyper CVAD has been used. It's been used at our own center and a number of other centers. Um, it's not necessarily a candidate for uh, an option for patients that are a little bit older, like in their 60s, uh, but certainly is a consideration. Uh, rituximab, bendamustine, and cytarabine, uh, the RBAC regimen, as well as BR, alternating with RARC, are all regimens that have been used and I think are viable options for patients uh, who are candidates for uh, 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 um, intensive induction therapy. I think the, the recurrent theme here is that cytarabine-based approaches for patients with, that are young and healthy and that are candidates for it uh, is, is most likely uh, the most effective approach, although I guess well, we'll have to see as we move forward. Uh, as I've been talking a lot about the role of autologous stem cell transplant in first remission, uh, and this is something that I think has been accepted at a number of centers, including our own, as, as a standard of care for patients who are candidates for it. I would point out that this is based in large part uh, on a now 13-year-old study uh, using CHOP as the backbone where patients were randomized to transplant versus interferon. Uh, and as you can see, there was a significant uh, uh, benefit uh, as far uh, with uh, the use of stem cell transplant. Um, although at this point, uh, most patients would probably not receive uh, our CHOP prior to a stem cell transplant given all of the different regimens that we've just discussed. And so because of, of this and the fact that, it, that the role of transplant is based on older uh, data, uh, the uh, U.S. Intergroup is now conducting a study uh, trying to ask the question about the importance of stem cell transplantation uh, in the current era. And this is uh, EA4151. Uh, and, and although this is a complicated table, the general premise is that patients can receive any induction therapy that, that, they're, that they would like. Uh, and at the end of induction therapy, there's an assessment of minimal residual disease. Those patients who are MRD negative uh, and NCR are then randomized to receive transplant followed by rituximab maintenance, whereas those patients that are, um, are, are sorry, randomized to receive transplant and rituximab maintenance versus rituximab alone. Those patients that are MRD positive um, or that are in PR, uh, all of them will go on to receive stem cell transplantation. And so this will hopefully help us answer this question in, in, the, in the modern era, although, I, again, I think there's, there likely will be additional questions that come out of this, but I'm happy to see this moving forward. And we have it open at our, study, at our center uh, and have accrued several patients. Uh, this is another uh, study, EA4181, uh, which is trying to explore which is the most appropriate uh, induction therapy for patients uh, in the current era. Uh, and this uh, will be a three-arm study uh, with BR alternating with R RRC versus BR with RRC plus a calibrutinib plus B versus BR plus a calibrutinib. Uh, and so again, this, is, this will be one study that will explore the possibility of, of, of removing cytarabine from the induction therapy approach as well as exploring the role of a novel therapy uh, as part of induction. And then the triangle study in Europe is also evaluating the role of transplant versus no transplant, as well as the role of ibrutinib maintenance, uh, ibrutinib induction and maintenance. And so I think all of these studies will hopefully help us in the next couple of years answer some of these questions about what is the optimal uh, approach to patients with mantle cell lymphoma. Just a few minutes about non-intensive approaches. Uh, there's probably not quite as much controversy uh, here, uh, but I think there still uh, it merits some discussion. Uh, Bendamustine rituximab uh, was, com uh, was compared to RCHOP in the STILL study. Uh, we discussed that previously in the, in the setting of follicular lymphoma. Uh, but as you can see, there uh, is a significant progression-free survival improvement. Uh, and then on the right, uh, R-squared uh, has, has been um, evaluated here at Cornell uh, with uh, pretty remarkable uh, long-term remissions. We have one patient that we follow uh, at Emory who was treated on this study who um, is doing great um, or is doing great and is now several years out. Um, and so uh, I think this is also potentially a viable alternative, although not currently FDA approved in this setting. And then finally, just a few words about rituximab maintenance. So as Dr. Leiter mentioned before, there's a lot of discussion about its use in follicular lymphoma. Similarly, it's been evaluated in a number of settings in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, the LIMA trial uh, used an RDHAP backbone uh, for four cycles, followed by stem cell transplant, and then randomized patients to receive rituximab maintenance versus observation. Uh, and uh, there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival, 83% versus 64%. Uh, as well as an overall survival benefit uh, displayed here on the, in the Kaplan-Meier curve. And based on this, uh, many, pa many people are now adopting maintenance uh, therapy for those patients that uh, complete autologous stem cell transplant after a cytarabine-based induction. Uh, 
In the non-transplant setting, we do have randomized data to support the use of maintenance rituximab after our CHOP. I would say that the benefit after bendamustine rituximab is less clear. Uh, there has been a small randomized study looking at its role after bendamustine rituximab, which showed no benefit. Uh, but again, I think that still is an open area of debate. Uh, and also, uh, I think it's important to consider some of the same discussions that came up before about potential infectious toxicities related to uh, maintenance rituximab after bendamustine. And so in summary, mantle cell lymphoma, it's a heterogeneous uh, disease, and management uh, is based on disease biology, patient fitness, comorbidities, and a number of other factors. It really, in my mind, is, a, is an individual patient-by-patient -patient discussion about how aggressive they are comfortable being, uh, and, uh, their age, their other comorbidities, and so forth. Upfront approaches, I think, can safely range from observation uh, to intensive therapy with consolidation with autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, and we do have a number of trials that are currently pending, which may alter our approach in coming years, including uh, information on the role of transplant, the use of minimal residual disease in the management of patients, as well as the role of novel therapies in the upfront setting. So thank you very much. Thank you.